Hallelujah. Come on. Let's give God glory for all that he has done. While you're standing, grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the Word of God tonight. And I want to call your attention to the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 10. And I want to look at a few verses there beginning at verse 17. St. Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven the grass withers and the flower fade but the word of our god shall stand forever you may be seated in the presence of the lord for a few moments i want to talk about proper power usage can everybody say that proper power usage can you clap your hands and praise God for the word of God? Proper power usage. Our presiding bishop gave us, I believe, a prophetic theme that is very much so applicable to the moments and times in which we live. Our mission made possible. With the scripture reference found in Zechariah's, Zechariah 4 and 6, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying not by power nor by might but by my spirit by my spirit notice the necessity and the essential context of the spirit in this particular theme reference it has a pneumatological underpinning that is within itself that says to us that it is by the spirit only that we are able to fulfill any mission assignment or purpose that god gives us it is through the agency and empowerment of the holy spirit the holy ghost the spirit of god that we are able to do the impossible that speaks of me of yes pneumatology but in our context pentecostalism in Pentecostalism, understand this, my brothers and sisters, yes, it has to do with the baptism in and being filled with the Holy Ghost. But may we be reminded that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is not just coming on the inside of us to cause us to speak in tongues, shout, dance, quick, and, sh and dance backward and forward at the same time. But he empowers us for missions, for service, for our calling, for our assignment. You know, a few months ago, I came across a provocative and intriguing vlog that was produced by the Dr. Dan Tumberland, who is a theologian and professor at Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And the title of the vlog was, What is Pentecostalism? And when I opened up the YouTube video, he said that he had searched the term Pentecostalism on YouTube. And to his surprise and amazement, he discovered diverse videos uh, relative to Pentecostalism, everything from snake handling to wild dancing. Even professors with PhDs mildly discussing Pentecostalism as a sociological movement and Orthodox and Catholic priests talking in favor of tongue speech. But as you continue to watch that YouTube video, he began to talk about all of the visual and audible survey that highlighted many excesses and even errors as it relates to Pentecostal spirituality. Which says to me, it is important, brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters, that we have a healthy understanding and expression of Pentecostal spirituality. First of all, Pentecostalism is not a denomination. It is not a fellowship. It is not a reformation. Pentecostalism has more to do with the present. It has more to do with the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in our lives, empowering us, leading us, and guiding us. And notice that I said Pentecostalism in as much as we are Pentecostal. 
But church of God in Christ, we've got to be careful that we don't believe that we are the only saints. Wish I had a witness in here. I quoted the late presiding Bishop J.O. Patterson the other night who once said, we are not the only saints, but we are saints only. And so what does that mean when we say we are Pentecostal, not just Church of God in Christ? First of all, we have what I believe is a five-goal, five-fold gospel concerning Jesus Christ. That he's our Savior, our Sanctifier, our Spirit Baptizer, our Hitler, and soon coming King. And then the affirmation of faith that the Church of God in Christ has, I believe, speaks to what it really means to be Pentecostal. We believe the Bible to be the inspired and only infallible written word of God. We believe that there's only one God that eternally existed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe in the blessed hope which is the rapture of the church of God, which is in Christ at his return. We believe that the only means of being cleansed from sin is through repentance and faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you know it, you ought to say it with me. We believe that the regeneration by the Holy Ghost is what? Absolutely essential for personal salvation. We believe that the redemptive work of Christ on the cross provides healing for the human body in answering a few years ago bishop my daughter came to me she may have been about eight or nine she said dad this is my favorite affirmation of faith we believe that the baptism in the holy ghost according to what acts two and four is given to believers who ask for it and then we believe in the sanctifying power of the holy spirit by who's in the dwelling the christian is enabled to live a holy somebody to clap your hands and praise God for this we believe but what is interesting that we have this doctrinal and theological foundation when we quote our affirmation of faith but when it comes to the practice or should I say the praxis because praxis has to do more within the practice and action. But praxis has to do with what we do, reflecting with what we believe. And sometimes we have found ourselves not reflecting what we say we believe. Because we don't have a clear indication of what it really means to be Pentecostal or have the power of the Holy Spirit at work. As a matter of fact, the, the text that we have before us tonight, if you go there, Jesus says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And then he used the word power again and said, Over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you or harm you. In this individual text, when you look at it in the King James Version, you see the word power twice. But when you read it from his original text, the Greek text, he says, Behold, I give unto you exousia, to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the dunamis of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So when he says, I have given unto you exousia, power, I've given unto you something that is intangible, something that is foundational, something that is simply a part of your nature and position as a child of God that you receive when you become a believer. He gives us exousia. He gives us ability. He gives us authority. Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis, the tangible power, the ability, the action, the practice. I give you the ability to have authority over the power, the dunamis of the enemy. Notice the distinction that Jesus makes in the text tonight. He, he distinguishes authority from ability or power, Dun dunamis, dynamite. And what has happened in the Pentecostal church, we have become more in tune with the dunamis until we miss the authority. Because the, uh, the dunamis has to do with the ability to do, to act, to practice.
practice, but the exousia has to do with whether you've been authorized to do it or not. And what is the distinction is that notice what Jesus says over all the power or the dunamis of the enemy. So that tells me that Satan has dunamis. But he doesn't have exousia. And the issue that we have is that sometimes as Pentecostal, we get excited about the dunamis. And we can easily be tricked and deceived. We can be distracted and deceived into believing just because there's an action that God is present. So often, watch this, the enemy does not fight against your gift or ability. But what the warfare is all about that we're engaged in is about the authority and not the dunamis because he already has dunamis. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them exousia. Let them have dominion because they were in his likeness after his image. But they had the great fall, but God has grace upon humanity. And he says, I'm going to restore not only your image, but I'm going to restore your authority. And Satan is so upset with you tonight because of the potential authority that rests upon your life. But the issue is we, get, keep, we keep getting caught up in the dunamis. And let me say this to you about authority. Authority has very little to do with having power or control over other people. Because when God created us, he didn't create us to rule over each other. He said, let them have dominion. So having authority is not about being a boss. It's not about being in charge and domineering and uh, being a dictator and a tyranny leader with a big title producing fear, intimidation and manipulation and distrust and stress. But authority is personal that God places on the inside of all of us that is internal and innate. It is within us and authority comes from within us. Authority is not a title. It's not a position. It's not exercising power over people, but authority produces power and ability for action and service to the glory and the honor of God. And we experience God's authority when we experience transformation. I'm reminded of Apostle Paul before his transformation and conversion. He was self-righteous and self-indulged. And he found out that you couldn't fight and wrestle against the authority of God. Hallelujah. And I believe that we need an encounter with God's authority so that we can be broken into submission unto him. Because that's the only way we can receive that authority. When you don't understand your authority, you'll pray unnecessary prayers. Some of us are praying too many unnecessary prayers. As a matter of fact, I'm reminded when Jesus was asleep on the hinder, hinder part of the ship and a storm arose and the disciples were afraid and they woke up. Jesus said, you don't care that we're out here perishing and I can see Jesus waking up frustrated, not with the storm, but with his disciples. And he hurries up and he speaks to the storm and says, peace, be still. And the water, the wind, and the wave lay down. But then he turns and rebuked his disciples. Can I give it to you like I read it and saw it? He said, why did you wake me up to do what you have the authority to do? So, Lord, stop the storm. Lord, stop the waves. Stop, stop the water from coming. No, he said, you should have done what I did. And when you have the authority, there's some prayers you don't have to pray. Just speak to the mountain. He said it'll be removed. You can speak to it. So many of us are laboring in prayer and I can hear the Spirit say some of you need to start using your authority and we're using too much, taking up too much time because we don't understand our authority. When you don't understand the authority you have, you'll live in the constant need of miracles. 
the Bible did not say the just shall live by miracles. The just shall live by faith. Because let me tell you, when you live by miracles, that's a little stressful. When everything is a miracle. But when you understand your authority, glory to God, you move and walk in faith. I wish I had a witness in here. But if we're going to exercise the authority that God has given us, it's time for shift. And what we're enamored with and by. We're enamored by dunamis. And when you're enamored by dunamis and don't have exousia, you're prone to becoming an entertainer and a performer. without the proper authority God created us to be human beings not human doings he created us to understand the essence of who we are that has been transformed by the spirit which gives us the authority God is more concerned about the authority not your ability he gave you your ability he gave you your talent he gave you your anointing he gave you your zeal he gave you your platform but he wants you to understand the authorization that is necessary to be effective in what he has given unto you to do so that means when you have authority he has given you domain and God told me to tell somebody tonight it's time to dominate your domain. Why don't you shake somebody's hand like you're about to shake it off and say, neighbor, it's time to dominate your domain. Some of us are spending more time trying to dominate in church until your home is disintegrated and tore up. Your marriage is messed up. Your money is messed up. Your health is messed up because you have aligned yourself with this idea that my greatness is tied to my dunamis. It's dangerous to be exclusively focused on dunamis. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in thy name we cast out devils. In your name we've done many miracles and wonderful works. And Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you because you didn't have the proper authority. You were doing dunamis. You were active, but you didn't have the connection and the relationship. You are, you are a worker of iniquity. Depart from me. See, anybody, hallelujah, if they, if they are under the influence of whatever spirit can, can cast out a devil, can, can even work a miracle. That's why everybody working miracles is not of God. That's why you need discernment. We watching everything and everybody on social media, following everybody and can't even support your own local church and your pastor who you know is a holy man of God in touch with God. But because you're so in touch with that dunamis that it leads us to deception, the devil can shout and dance, the devil can speak in tongue, the devil can work miracles. If you don't believe me, you can look at chapter 19. And there were seven sons, one of Sceva, a Jew and a chief of priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but the devil even though you don't have authority. He says, who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on came on them and overcame them and prevailed against them because they, had, they were trying to operate in dunamis with no exousia. And even as it relates to the gifts of the spirit, even functioning in the body of Christ, in the church, the Bible said, let everything be done decently and in order. Because if you have authority, you've been given authority. You have to be submitted to receive the authority. And when you come into this context, the church, there is an order. As a matter of fact, Paul said, if there's going to be someone speaking in tongue, let it be done by two or three. If somebody is going to prophesy, let it be done by two or three. He said, if there's no interpreter, let one interpret. But in essence, he said, let the other judge. 
to determine whether this has been authorized by God or not. And we're sad that we're living at a time now we can't rebuke, can't bring reproach, can't bring order in the church. They're trying to smother my gift. They're trying to hold me back. No, we're trying to ensure that the authority that God has given to the house of God maintains its space and place to be a true house of worship. I don't care how anointed you are, you still are subject to the proper authorities. My grandfather taught me that there's no anointing in that house higher than that pastor. I remember a few years ago, I was a young college student in Chattanooga. A pastor at that time was Pastor C.H. Douglas, just went home to be with the Lord. And I was an organist at the time, and the spirit was high one night. And Pastor Douglas is up ministering, and the spirit of the Lord Bishop spoke to me and said, Go minister to a young lady that was sitting there in the audience. But my training said, my pastor is up. I wish I had a witness in here. My training under authority said, don't make a scene to put the spotlight on you while God is using him. And every time I think about it, hallelujah, I get excited because it lets me know how God is real. And while I was sitting there accompanying him on the organ, he turned around and said, Minister Dillard, get up and go do what God told you to do. When God calls you, when God speaks to you, you don't have to be a wonder. God will make a way for you to utilize the gift that he's given unto you. You got to learn how to submit to the authority. The church in Acts was praying, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Saul and Barnabas. And the Bible said that the apostles came together and laid hands on them and confirmed what the Spirit had given, given them authority to do. I could stay there all night, but don't have time. But Jesus wants us to understand the proper use of power. When you don't understand the proper use of power, you will misuse it or abuse it, abuse it. And then we live a life that is, that is not reflective of what God has planned for you. But tonight the Lord told me there are some people in this room that he's about to restore authority back to your life back to your home, back to your church, back to your ministry, watch this, back to your family, back to your marriage, Holly, everything concerning you, God said he's getting ready to restore that authority because God says the devil wanted to keep you in ignorance, he did not want you to have revelation or illumination, but God said get ready for restoration, you're getting ready to tread over serpents and scorpions and do what God said for you to do. In our text tonight, we see something very interesting here where Jesus has set out for Jerusalem. The time of his crucifixion is near, which would bring a close to his earthly ministry. And when you read St. Luke chapter 10, you will see a sense of urgency where Jesus gives an assignment to 72 missionaries, similar to the mission and charge that he gave to the 12 in chapter 9. I believe this shows us the task of ministry is not confined just to the 12 or just the elite. But not only does he give them the mission and the charge, but he equip, equips them with power and send them out by pairs of 36. And he sends them the places that he plans to come after them. But their mission was to go ahead of him to prepare the places he would visit for his ministry that was yet to come to those places. And when you read it, he, he speaks about the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. In other words, Jesus said the people are ready to receive the harvest, but there are only a few workers. But not only that, but Jesus says, I want you all to pray that we can have more, har more laborers together the harvest. But then as Jesus continues, he, he talks to them about all of their responsibilities. And when you get to verse 3, Jesus says, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Now that word wolves refers to danger. 
In other words, Jesus said that, that they were going to face those religious, prideful, hypocritical individuals that would eventually lead to violence. He calls them lambs. He suggests that the disciples would be defenseless before their enemies, like lambs before ravening wolves. But like Jesus himself, they are not to prepare to defend themselves or minister in their own strength. But he wanted their focus to be preparing the people for his coming. I wish I had a church in here. And notice what happened when we get to the text we just read. When they return to Jesus. They don't talk about the messages that were ministered and how many people received the message. They come back talking about dunamis. We don't know how long the 72 are away, but when they return, they come rejoicing specifically about being successful and casting out devils. It was almost as if they were shocked they were able to cast out demons. But notice what Jesus says when they say that. He says, I beheld Satan like lightning being cast out of heaven. Now there are three views that several theologians would suggest that this perhaps Jesus was speaking to the pre-existent Christ that witnessed the fall of Satan in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 when he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? And then others say that Jesus witnessed Satan's fall in the wilderness at the time that he was tempted in St. Luke chapter 4. And then the third view is that Jesus had a vision that while the 72 were ministering under his authority, that, uh, that Satan, he saw Satan coming out of heaven like lightning. In other words, Jesus, I believe the third is the view that probably what Jesus was referring to, that while they were working the casting out of demons, Jesus saw it to confirm it. But Jesus wanted them to know and understand that you did this not by your own might or power or authority, but you did this because of something I've already done. In other words, you don't have authority on your own, but because of the work that I've already done. I wish I had a witness in here. He says that you would have been powerless. You wouldn't have been able to deal with demons if you did not have my backing and authorization. I wish I had a church in here. In other words, Jesus says, I don't want you to get caught up in casting out devils because that's really secondary. Don't get so caught up in trying to cast out devils that you miss your mission. In other words, God says, I sent you out there for the harvest. And you're harvesting demons. You're talking about how much you have power you have. And so many times when we're trying to be wonders, we miss out on the true mission of the church. That he told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against miracle signs and wonders. But that's what they are. They are signs. And the issue again that we have is that when we start focusing again on the dunamis, we miss the authority. That's why you have individuals who will build a ministry around their dunamis. I wish I had a witness. The Lord used you one time to lay hands on somebody. Now this is a special hand that nobody can't even shake it. Now you have a healing ministry. But the truth of the matter is that if you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you, any one of the gifts can work through any saint. Jesus says, I want you to understand something that I'm closing here. He says, I give you power. I give you authority over serpents and scorpions. That doesn't mean you go out and tempt and test the authority. That's what happened in early Pentecostalism. There were some who went and started getting crates and filling them up with poisonous snakes. And when they say the spirit would come in the church, they would roll the boxes in. And they start handling snakes and dancing and speaking in tongues and passing it around. And if you got bitten, that means you wasn't in the spirit and you died and the reality is that God never told us to go after the serpent he told us to go after the mission but just in case you run into a serpent just in case you run into a scorpion then he says I want you to use power to overcome him he says 
I give you power, exousia, over all the dunamis of the enemy. And when you have this kind of authority, nothing, I wish I had a church to help me say nothing. Say it one more time, nothing. What does nothing mean? No thing, nothing by any means shall hurt you. That's why Jesus said no hell shall prevail. As a matter of fact, some of you should have been running a few moments ago when we were celebrating because it was the authority of God over your life that spared you. It was the authority of God in your life that caused you to still be here. You should be dead, gone, should have lost your mind, but you're still here. It's because God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy so if we're gonna have proper power usage you got to understand proper origination of power power comes from God God is the author he's the source and origin of our power authority and gifting and calling and ability God is the originator of our power not the witch not witchcraft nor warlocks but God is the author of our power we are authenticated by God we have permission from God to live to serve to lead and to love proper origination then we have to have proper motivation that's what Jesus was trying to put them back in the right perspective about the power. Because power can go to your head. Especially if you never had power before. And when you start having power that is used, you will abuse it. So we need the proper motivation. We need the proper origination. The proper motivation. But then also you need the proper certification. I see that in verse 20 he says notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but he said rejoice that your names are written in heaven I wish I had a witness in here in other words God says the proper certification for proper proper power usage is where you've been certified where is your name registered because where your name is registered will determine the exercise of the power and the authority that God has given you. Because the reason why nothing by any means shall harm us, because why names are written in heaven. Look at somebody tell them, my name is written in heaven. They used to have a song when I was growing up that said, my name. Then the response was, it's written down. Anybody know your name is written in heaven? I know some of us, when we think about heaven, we only think about the afterlife. But when you think about heaven, it's not just talking about the great beyond. But heaven has to do with the kingdom of God. And when my name has been certified and written in heaven, that means I have the opportunity to exercise the authority that God has given me. Look at somebody, ask them, do you know where your name is? Ask somebody on the other side, do you know where your name is? Because when your name is written in heaven, heaven will back up everything you say. That's why the power of life and death lies within your tongue. It's because your name has been certified. And that's why Jesus said, he said, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And he said, behold, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven somebody say why because my name has been certified in heaven because Jesus he said in his word that these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover and if they drink anything deadly it shall not harm them grab somebody by the hand and shake it like you're about to shake it off and say neighbor I've been certified I've been authorized I've got the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions because I've got the authority every place 
that the sole of my feet shall tread upon God said I've already given you because I've got the authority when I go through the fire I won't get burned when I go through the water I won't drown look at somebody say I have the authority because I've got the word the word of God and his word tell me that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want I've got the authority because his word says no weapon that's formed against me shall be able to prosper slap somebody high five and tell them I've got the word and that means I've got the authority I've got the authority because greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world Tell somebody on the other side, I've got the authority. Nay, in all these things, we are more. We're more than conquerors. Yeah. Look at somebody say, I've got the authority. This is the last day. I'm going to be depressed. This is the last day. I'm going to be broke. This is the last day. I'm going to be sick. This is the last day. I'm going to be bound because I'm taking authority over my life. I'm taking authority over my family. I'm taking authority over all of the things that God has given unto me. And I'm coming in the enemy's camp to take back what the devil stole from me. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, whatever you do, you show authority. And when you step out, God's going to back you up. I see the angels. I see glory. I see the spirit getting ready to come to your rescue. I know it's been rough. I know it's been tough. And I know you feel like you're out there by yourself But because you're under the authority of the Holy Ghost I came to tell you that whatever the enemy had planned It will not work I command you to be healed Be delivered Be set free Get out of your seat And tell three people Be healed be delivered, be set free. Tell two more people, be healed. Be delivered, be set free. Come on, church of God in Christ. Let's use our power. Let's go back to casting out demons under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Let's go back until we see transformation. Let's go back until we see sanctification. Because I got power you can't see. God is living inside of me. I can conquer any enemy. Because God, I said God and me makes the majority. And if you believe you have the authority, don't wait. Don't wait till the battle is over. But you ought to shout right now. You ought to leap right now. You ought to dance right now. You ought to give God glory because your power is back. The power is back. Get out of your seat. Touch as many people as you can and say the power is back. The power is back. The devil tried to take it, tried to steal it, tried to hold it down. But I see God. I see his glory. I see his spirit be filled with the Holy Ghost. Reach up. Reach up and receive it. Fill us again. Baptize us again. In the Holy Ghost. Somebody open up your mouth and shout.